be done down, and there's no college and no university, no school of law that teaches the Constitution as it ought to be taught. Mm -hmm. And he said the only way you can learn this is by diligent application and study of these documents I mentioned before. And he gave me a whole bunch of them to get started. And he said, if you, if you have tenacity of purpose, as I think you do, he said, when you get through these, you'll begin to know something about the Constitution. He says, it's impossible for one man to know all there is about the Constitution in his lifetime. It's just too short. Right, right. He said, the depth and the profundity of the United States Constitution totally escapes politicians and, and most of the people, unfortunately, who should know better. So as far as, there, as far as building an empire, that's completely for, forbidden. But they're, but they're doing it nonetheless. Uh, and how, they're how, doing it nonetheless by, yeah. flouting the, by flouting their own highest law of the land. That's right. Uh, how did you stumble over you know, this information about this committee of, of 300 men? Did you find documentation about them or historical record referencing uh, uh, this particular group? Well, there was, there was a place called India House that was once established, and they had a meticulous record of all the doings of the East India Company. And just in time, these records were transferred to the British Museum in London because shortly after that, uh, India House was burned to the ground and everything was lost. But the records were safely preserved of the East India Company in the libraries and the annals in the, uh, of the British Museum in London. And I was able, by virtue of my special status, to gain entry into what I call the inner sanctum of the British Museum, where the public was never permitted to go and never saw any of these documents. It was there that I came across the uh, British East India Company and its records and how it had once been the most powerful trading company in the world, how in fact they'd even tried to stop the Americans from going west by arming the Indians in the Hudson Bay Company in, in Canada, mm. which was one of their companies. They armed and supplied the Indians with rifles in order to stop the Americans from going west to California and to places like um, Oregon and eventually to Utah. That's another story that's very interesting, and um, it doesn't really, I don't really have the time today to delve too much into that, but all of these things, as I say, I studied very diligently in the British Museum, and along with my own records, and I have something like 37,000 copies of these Annals of Congress, I think it's an achievement that very few Americans have been able to to get to because um, it takes a long, long time and it's not the kind of thing that you read easily. It's not like a book sure. that flows. This is, you have to, my, I have that special color code and if you look at my copies, they're full of red, blue, yellow, and purple underlinings, but everything stands for something and that's how I was able to keep track and find out about this tremendously powerful company called the the British East India Company. Yes. And, and they even got a charter from the King of England to wage war on their own account. They had armies, they had foreign mission diplomats. They were a government within the government and very, very powerful people. And they dictated the policies. And uh, they went to war against China three times because China didn't want its people turned into a nation of opium addicts. Yeah. And this was a, this was a huge market for them. So it gets very deep and very uh, profound when you really get down to it, which is what I did. And that is how I came to write the book, The Committee of 300, because that, that uh, discloses all of this information. And once you begin, I had a lawyer phone me up one day and he said, I got your book and I started reading it on Friday night. He said, I finished it on Saturday night. He said, and I started from the beginning and I read right through it again the weekend. And he said, I even wanted to write through it, write, read through it again on Monday, but I had to go to my normal duties of work, so I couldn't do that. Mm. It's, a, it's a profound book. I don't say this to put laurels around my neck, far be that from what I want, but it is a book of knowledge that deserves to be in the hands of every American family and even Canadian people because there's a lot about Canada and how they inveigled Canada to come into the scheme. Now, the leading Canadian families were also involved in this. 
W wouldn't you so, say, though, uh, uh, John, that this also concerns, obviously, all the citizens of uh, the entire planet here, because uh, this, this, the strive uh, of uh, many of the groups that we can find traces of out there is, of course, in many cases, world dominations, uh, world domination, it seems like. So, uh, that's right. I the, yeah, that's, that everybody, the, right? That, yeah, that was the eventual goal. The eventual goal was a new world order inside a one world government where everybody would be just uh, equal down to nothing. And the big thing was the destruction to get rid of the American middle class, which was a unique class of people never been seen in any society in the world before. And to that extent, they've largely succeeded. If you look around today, the middle class as a people in America has virtually disappeared. Yeah. The jobs were exported to other countries, and uh, there is today no middle class. That's right. It's uh, on its way out. Uh, John, if we quickly go back to the, the documents that you mentioned again, because I find that interesting as well, uh, the, the documents that you studied in the uh, British Museum in London. Uh, do you know if the documents are still there? And, and if so, what kind of status, as you mentioned, do, do you need to have to go into the museum and actually see these well, documents? You, you need to have had military service in the, in, the, in the British Armed Forces to a higher degree. In other words, you must have been a colonel or a higher rank, and then you get access to it. If you haven't, then you've not got no chance of getting in there at all. It's a very secret, it's a very secret part of a British museum, and very few people even know it exists. Right. Yeah, and uh, I, I reckon this this would be a, a vast. Is that a vast library of of, uh, of documentation that you can go through? And it must. If so, it must be some kind of. Uh, is is there people keeping track on these and and indexing uh, the contents of of uh, you know what is there in terms of all the documents? Well, you would need a mentor. They do have mentors in the in the in the museum. Yeah, and they can if they take a special liking to you. They can make it very, very easy for you. If they don't like you, they can make it very difficult for you. <laughs> I was fortunate that one of them seemed to adopt me, and he was of great, of greatest assistance to me, and enabled me to make all my notes and prepare my book, prepare for my book. Without his help, I would not have been able to complete the task. Interesting. And, and As then... I said, it's a book that was begun many, many years ago. And it's taken the better part of my adult life to finish and present. Did, did you find any of the, you know, historical references here in terms of the this group of three hundred? As I did some a bit of research here as well. Obviously, the the thing that I came up with is it seems to be that a reference made by Walter Rathenauer is one of the earliest ones, the statesman who who served as a foreign minister of the, uh, you know, of, of that time Germany, the Weimar uh, Republic. Is That's that right. something you can confirm, uh, John? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Walter Rathenau went right out on the limb and exposed the people. And, of course, for that he was murdered. He was shot and murdered outside his house one day. It's a very tragic story. Well, it's contained in the book. The full story is contained in there. Also very interesting for a lot of people who made a big issue out of it is the history of the Beatles. Now, you may, well, might wonder what that's doing in a book like The Conspiracy, but it's all part of The Conspiracy. Because the prime task of the Beatles was to sing, to, uh, to organize music, and to play at these concerts that attracted, uh, attracted millions of the youth, and then give out pack, little packets of drugs, heroin and, H, and LSD and all that kind, not LSD, but uh, heroin and opium for them to try out. And many of them, of course, became drug addicts by attending these massive concerts. And, and there again, you find that the music was not con the music for the Beatles. When they were discovered, they were playing in a cellar in uh, Hamburg's red light district. That's, That's right. a small little downstairs cellar. And if you've ever been to Hamburg, there are literally hundreds of them. And they have little small bands playing there and they have food going and everything. And the Beatles played in one of those. They weren't called the Beatles at all. And the, the reason they called the Beatles is that they, they took the name was given to them by one of the dignitaries in England because the Scarab Beetle of Egypt was supposed to be a sign of knowledge and immense knowledge. Mm -hmm. That's why they called them the Beatles. They were supposed to be spreading immense knowledge through their music. 
and you know we had the story that they wrote most of their music that's not true at all in the latter part they might have written a few pieces but the majority of their music was written by and uh, for them by a man who was specially commissioned and even he was given a place at the at, at uh, the Queen's Northern residence and all facilities to help these people, the Beatles, write the lyrics and the music to uh, their music. And this is something that you detail, uh, or I think as well, that you go into in the uh, the Tavistock Institute of Human Relations, uh, that particular book as that's well, right. right? Yeah. Yes, that's also my book, and it's, it tells how we as a nation have been totally controlled in every aspect of the our policies, even going to war, by the Tavistock Institute, which is the largest brainwashing, if I, you may use a colloquial term, amaze the largest brainwashing institution in the world. And that, that book, of course, is also available to your, to your listeners. And if they want to see what we've got to offer, they can go to the website, sales at coleman300.com. Excellent. Uh, we'll definitely give out the website again uh, later on uh, as we wrap things up uh, for the first hour here, John. But w- uh, if we go back a little bit to the 300 again, uh, I, and we, we briefly mentioned Walter Rathenau, that that's one source. And obviously then there seems to be other references throughout history as well. And I want to know if you have made these connections as well. Uh, a couple of years ago now, there was actually a a movie. Uh, I think that this is a remake as well, actually. It was called 300. And it was actually about a small Spartan uh, army that was, uh, you know, fighting basically the uh, the uh, the Persians with the Xerxes. Uh, this was a reference to the Battle of, uh, uh, I think it's called Thermopylae. If I I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, but these Spart- this Spartan group anyway, who call themselves the Three Hundred. Do you think that any of this goes back to that particular uh, group? No, or that's stretching nothing. It? That's nothing. That absolutely no, nothing to do with what I'm talking about. Nothing okay. whatsoever. All right. Um, and. Uh, other references I found as well was in terms of uh, during the French Revolution. Uh, I don't know if this was Cagliastro who referenced this as well, but there was somebody who allegedly uh, shouted out during, I don't know what you know what particular time this is during the revolution, but uh, like someone who is representing the forces of the revolution, the We Are 300 Men, someone shouted out. Uh, have you heard about that before, uh, John? Yes, that's, that's a fact. That did happen. <laughs> That did, in fact, happen. They were defending the barricades and manning the barricades, and that's what they said. We are 300, but we are also powerful in other directions. So it was not directly connected with this historical matter that I'm talking about, but all of these had some significance in the number 300. Mm. And that's something which... I was never actually able to uh, get right to the bottom of, except that there were 300 families that controlled the United States and the and and uh, England and the UK and Euro- all of Europe. In fact, they were the kings and the princes and uh, the high high officials of these nations. Not in the United States, we didn't have kings and princes. We just pensioned that a long time ago. Mm. But as I said, they included their their the U.S. Uh, relations, like the Anderside Perkins family, for instance, which controlled all of the trade uh, out of Boston. Very, very aristocratic families, to use a term that uh, might just explain it better than any other term. The the uh, Committee of 300 are also best re- referred to as uh, the Olympians, uh, another kind of, you know, Greek uh, Roman reference, if you will, as well there. But is would you, uh, you know, equate this group, uh, the 300, uh, with the um, the Illuminati, this group that, uh, you know, many uh, people now are well, getting savvy to the, and so forth? They did say we are the 300, yes, and they are the 300. And as I said, they're made up of the, the rulers of the world. The Illuminati is only a cog in this immense machine. It's one of the cogs in this huge machine. And it's just a part of the whole apparatus. And it has a special purpose, of course. And um, we know that uh, it's been going for a long, long time. It began in Bavaria with a conspiracy against the kings. 
and the princes of the nation, that was uncovered, and they, were tried, they tried to stamp these 